to the High Tea with Grace podcast, where we spill the tea on HIT. I'm thrilled to welcome Dr. Parmjot Baines, CEO of Impedimed. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Baines, for a special Lymphedema Awareness Month episode. Thank you, Grace. It is wonderful to be here, and thank you for the opportunity. So great to have you, and I can't wait to dive into this one. Tell me a little bit about the path that brought you to your role at Impedimed. Yes, no, absolutely. So I have just started this role. I have been at Impedimed now for two months as the CEO. Prior to coming to Impedimed, I was I trained as a medical doctor in Australia and New Zealand and then um, worked at McKinsey Management Consulting for a number of years in drug development and then was at Pfizer for the last eight years where I was running, our, the most recent role was running our Pfizer business in the Gulf cluster of countries, so up in Dubai. So now I'm very excited to be able to come and work with Impedimed to really help women with lymphedema and with breast cancer and in fact people with other cancers that get lymphedema to really help bring this breakthrough that will truly change patients' lives. Wow, so interesting. I'm thrilled to have you on then for Lymphedema Awareness Month. So we know it's Lymphedema Awareness Month this month in March, and it presents us all kind of an opportunity to create public awareness of breast cancer related lymphedema. So what is lymphedema? And from an industry standpoint, what do you feel needs to be conveyed to raise awareness about this? Yeah, so lymphedema is really it can be, unfortunately, a lifelong debilitating condition that results in swelling of the limbs, arms, legs. Actually, lymphedema can occur anywhere in the body where the lymphatic system is for some reason breaking down. What we're looking at specifically at Impedimed is where a secondary lymphedema, where lymphedema is a result of cancer, where either the lymph nodes have had surgery on them or they've had radiation therapy or some other intervention that means that the lymphatic system is no longer working properly. Um, as a result, unfortunately, with lymphedema, women, unless it's treated early, men and women can end up with chronic swelling of the limbs that can actually lead to infection and hospitalization. Oh, man. Oh, my goodness. So swelling of the lungs, what does that look like? Yeah, so early on, it might just come up as a very, very kind of early swelling. The arm is a little bit bigger. Now technology enables us to measure up to three tablespoons of difference of fluid in the arm, which is wonderful because that enables early detection and treatment. Unfortunately, if it's not detected early, it can actually progressively increase in swelling. And in the long term, it can actually lead to fibrosis. So the arm can get quite kind of fibrotic and um, it can become very, very chronic. Um, and unfortunately, that, that fibrosis and when the fluid is not moving, it can actually lead to chronic um, swelling and infections. And in fact, yesterday I met um, one of our shareholders from Pedimed. It's a guy, he had um, mel melanoma surgery, which took the lymph nodes out of his pelvic area. He has for his for the last 10 years been, unfortunately had severe lymphedema of the left leg. And he's been in hospital five times to get this treated. So early detection is absolutely critical. So what measures can providers implement to ensure this timely intervention for patients that are experiencing this? Yes, so what, um, what we've got with Impedimed is a device we call Sozo. And Sozo has had a very large scale clinical trial with 1,200 patients or women with breast cancer. And the intervention has been uh, patients are tested pre-surgery where we get a baseline measurement of the fluid that, that is in their arms. And then immediately post-surgery, and for the next three years, they tested every three months. That enables us to detect lymphedema very, very early. And when you can get early detection of lymphedema for what we call stage zero or stage one, putting a sleeve on the arm, like a compression sleeve on the arm for four weeks, will actually completely resolve the lymphedema. So what we've got is patients with stage zero and stage one, so very early lymphedema, pretty much that sleeve will get rid of, stage zero, the sleeve will get rid of all lymphedema. And so they're basically treated going forward. Stage one, maybe 80, 90% of lymphedema will be picked up and will be treated. In our clinical trial, 92% of patients have their lymphedema resolved. If you leave it to stage three and stage four, it becomes a chronic and debilitating condition. So early detection is absolutely critical. 
think what's um, interesting is that this device was compared to what was a what's historical and what what is used was standard of practice was a tape measure. So a woman would have their arms measured with a tape. What this does is it enables the early detection through bioimpedance testing. So so measuring an electric current through the body and getting a very accurate assessment of the fluid levels in the limbs. Wow. And so are you using kind of predictive algorithms as well as part of that? Or is it mostly yeah, the physical physiology? Mm -hmm. Yes. So it's actually right now it's using just the electrical current. So we've basically mm -hmm. done a lot of work with this device. Um, the device is you know, over 10 years in development. Um, and so we've got a mathematical algorithm that actually looks at what is the, what is the fluid level and then we compare it to the range of normal. What um, happens with, with the women and, and the men that get tested for lymphedema, mm -hmm. women for breast and, and um, you know, we're picking up the melanomas and other cancers, is we set a baseline for that patient. So that's why the pre-op testing is very normal because everybody will have a different level of uh, uh, fluid in their arms and legs. So we set a norm and a baseline for them and then we'll basically keep testing patients over the next two to three years because people can trigger at any point over those next three years. And we've seen that. And it won't happen immediately after surgery. We've seen patients trigger two years after surgery or three years after surgery. So it can happen at any time. And so it's very important to keep a very close eye on it. Mm, it's true. I can't imagine. And it's it's wild that you could help it <laughs> if you catch it soon enough. So, you know, which healthcare providers should be prioritizing raising awareness and proactive measures to make sure you're getting that timely intervention? Yes. No. So the who, who we're talking with most closely at the moment are mm -hmm. the breast cancer surgeons or the surgeons that are that are mm -hmm. operating. So lymphedema is is you know if you look at women there are about three hundred thousand breast cancers in the United States um, per annum. What's amazing is now they're treatable. You know, a lot of cancer is now treatable, but unfortunately, you know, the side effects and, and complications of treatment are, are still there. Um, and lymphedema is probably one of the most dreaded. And so we work very closely with breast cancer surgeons to make sure that, you know, everybody is aware of the risk of lymphedema. We've got patient education material to make sure that patients are aware of lymphedema, that this is a risk. And so we're working with them to make sure that this device is available in surgery in the breast cancer surgeon's offices. What's uh, most interesting and, and wonderful um, is that uh, because of the importance of this disease and, and the lifelong debilitating nature of it, the US private payers are also reimbursing this now. So oh, the cost that's is, critical. Is, it is very, very important. And so the cost of the test is now being covered. So, you know, we're picking up significant momentum on payer coverage. So we have 16 states in the United States where over 80% of um, patients are now going to be uh, reimbursed. And we are seeing significant momentum that hopefully by the middle of this year, at least 85% of the country will be covered in terms of this. And Medicare wow. is already covering it. Wow, um, that's fantastic news. I mean, so critical to be able to support um, these men and women that have breast cancer related lymphedema. So are there any legislations that you're tracking um, around lymphedema, around breast cancer that impact, sh that people should know about? Um, and yes. and what are the, what do they speak to? Exactly. So one um, one a great piece of legislation in the United States is the Lymphedema Treatment Act, which has really helped shape the landscape for lymphedema treatment. Oh wow! So as as recently as the beginning of this year, um, Medicare coverage has basically provided for reimbursement of those compression garments. So that's uh, for, for lymphedema, really for men and for women. So men will often get it as a result, either primary, that um, for some physiological reason, or through surgery, um, being a melanoma surgery or other surgery where the lymph nodes are being impacted. So there are three to five million men, women and children living with lymphedema in the United States. So this Treatment Act, um, signed into law in December 2022, now provides coverage for those compression garments, which, you know, we, we're there for detection and early detection, but we really need the supplies and the compression supplies to enable treatment. So what do the compression garments look like? <laughs> Can you yeah, explain yeah. it to me? Like somebody that's having this swell, tremendous swelling because of breast cancer related lymphedema, what are what are they like? Um, what would people expect to see when they get one? Yes, so they, they just they can be sleeves. So generally, just sleeves or gloves, or but you know, for if it's men or even women that have had surgery in the pelvic region, it will be a stocking. So it's basically just a compression garment that will really compress the lymphatic system back up. 
Um, and what was interesting is in the clinical trial, you know, if we had we did our trial on women with breast cancer, just four weeks of wearing that sleeve um, resulted in 92% of women resolving the lymphedema. So if wow. four, if we, just four weeks of wearing the sleeve, I mean, yesterday, the gentleman that I met that had had the melanoma, he has to wear it all the time. So, you know, four weeks of, of treatment with early detection is, you know, so much better than a lifetime of, of wearing that that stocking or the, the, the sleeve garment on your arms. Yeah. Well, how does this lymphedema kind of impact the day to day, you know, what what are the challenging these challenges these patients and even their caregivers are facing um, when the people they love or they themselves are experiencing it? Um, yeah, what's their quality quality of life? Oh, look, it's just um, depending on and how that disease progresses, um, it can. You know, it's it's it can be a lifelong debility um, disability. It's mm -hmm. the arms over time can just can, will just be really large um, and can end up being fibrotic. I actually went, met with Dr. Lynch, who is one of our breast cancer surgeons, who's using Sozo at Yale in New Haven, so very close to you. <laughs> you know, a month or so ago, and she was telling me the story of this young woman who had breast cancer um, and had the the surgery and and was really struggling to look at that area of her breast just because it's so you know, and she was a young model, actually. She's a beautiful young lady. Um, came back in and just didn't really want to look at her arm or check under her arm. And she said, you know, we use the Sozo and she had lymphedema, right? Like very early oh. lymphedema, just a little bit wrinkling under the arm. So luckily they caught that early. But, you know, can you imagine that just that lifelong, if that swelling continued and had been picked up, it would have progressed. This gentleman yesterday that I met who had the melanoma, um, he's been in hospital five times. He said he keeps ah. so infection of the legs. Um, and so it, um, if not treated early, it, it um, can be a real real problem. And historically, 20%, you know, the data in the US shows 20% of women got lymphedema. So mm. that's a lot of lymphedema sufferers that if we can detect early, you know, we just don't need to have. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, what role does uh, patients now sharing their stories play in making real change happen, uh, you know, as, a, as it relates to lymphedema or just healthcare generally? What has your experience been with the power of the patient's story? Yeah, the patients are just so important. Even, even you know, I practice medicine, but even, and, and even now I the hearing the patient's story just brings it all back to, to life because really, you know, we are here to bring these breakthroughs that change patients' lives, right? And and patients are at the heart of everything that we do. And they're everything that we do here at Impediment as well. And so um, it just really helps to resonate and, um, with, with providers, with payers. You know, patients have the strongest voices and are really the best advocates for their own healthcare and their own um, technologies. So it's, um, you know, we are sharing patient stories. Um, every time I hear a story, I, I try to share it and I try to amplify it. We've just started a partnership with Susan G. Komen, who is the big, big breast cancer advocacy group in the United States, just to make sure we are helping elevate that patient voice and that when a woman has breast cancer surgery, I want her to be Googling this and, and to know that lymphedema is a problem and to be asking her surgeon, you know, or her any of her therapists as she goes through this journey, you know, I would like to be screened early so that I can stop and not have lymphedema for the rest of my life, you know, for what is now a very treatable condition. So powerful, so powerful. And I love that you're doing that. You know, if you can give our listeners an example of what they should be looking for, you know, in terms of lymphedema, can you kind of share a little bit just about what they would need to look for to, to think maybe I need to go in and have somebody take a look at it? Yes, no, exactly. So with um, so with women, you know, or, and look, anyone that's having any kind of surgery or even radiotherapy on any of the lymph nodes up in the upper limbs or in the in the kind of pelvic region, is just to be aware that lymphedema is a risk, right? And so what you know, the thought is the the knowledge and the understanding is that. For breast cancer patients, 80% of women are at risk of lymphedema, right? So 20% will get it, but, you know, pretty much everyone needs to think that they are at risk of lymphedema. So pre-op, you know, if you know that you're going to get some kind of surgery intervention, is to make sure that you are getting screened. Um, you know, we are we are working very hard to make sure that SOZO is available in all centres in the United States, but even just to take measure. So just a screening to say, look, is someone just checking me and screening me? 
you know, the US has a wonderful community of lymphedema therapists whose job it is to help manage lymphedema. So to make sure that A, you're being screened first and foremost, and then just keeping an eye out for any swelling. But, the, you know, the brilliance of the technology is that it, it will detect it before you can see it because it can detect tablespoons of difference of fluid between the two arms. And so that's that's when we've got to catch it. Right. It's not when it's visible, it's it's there and you're you're progressing, you know, further down. But still it absolutely needs to be treated, even if you can see any kind of swelling or difference in the arms. Mm, thank you for sharing that. So critical. You know, and I'm wondering, how does your personal experience of healthcare impact the work that you do? You know, what has been some of the experiences you've had as a physician or as a patient that really just made an impact and keeps you going, keeps you moving in this kind of role you're in now? Yes, no, absolutely. Both, um, you know, physician as a patient, um, as somebody that has worked in healthcare for a number of years, it's really, it's always been about the patient and bringing that that medicine or the device or the technology to the patient. And um, when I first joined Pfizer, one of my roles, which was fantastic, and it really brought a lot of this home was we were building global public health programs to bring medicine to patients in low income settings. And so my job was to bring cancer wow. treatment. And what we did was a partnership with the American Cancer Society and the Clinton Health Access Initiative to bring cancer medicines to patients in Africa. And so when you're out there, you you know, they really have very few um, products available or the products they were getting were counterfeit or and so the doctor would give me stories that would say look we know it's not working because people's hair isn't falling out so we actually think that it's there's actually nothing in there so it was that in that instance it was just making sure high quality medicines got to patients because without these these medicines or devices or drugs you know there's not much you can do as a healthcare provider right like they're just so critical so our job is to make sure that we get this to every patient that needs it and um, that's always been just first and foremost in my mind is we live in a wonderful world of amazing technologies and amazing products but if we can't communicate to the patients and to the doctors to get this out there then we won't get the impact um, that we want to have it sounds like you're a change maker. <laughs> you're not yes. someone that could just sit back and let things go. You got to make the change and make it happen, which I love that. So, yeah. you know, as a busy career woman, you know, making an, a big impact in this area, you know, I'm wondering what are some things you do in your personal life so that you can work your best in and make a difference? Do you have any habits that you do on a day to day basis that just keep you going and keep you revving up, whether it's working out or eating right or even a mindset that you keep? No, absolutely, because it's not just um, not just a, a career mother. I'm, I'm a mother of three, <laughs> so a 21-year-old. Wow, wow. And a 15-year-old. So, yeah, no, trying to trying to balance and, and um, you know, get the most out of everything, right? Um, you know, the children going through university now or college, um, as you'd say in the U.S., um, in high school, um, I do exercise every day. So it is just one of my um, non-negotiables. A number of years ago, I decided to make it a habit and say, you know what, I'm going to um, make an exception if I don't exercise as opposed to if I do exercise. Because, um, you know, in the past used to be like, oh, I went to the gym today. And then I thought, no, I need to switch that mindset. I need to be that, oh, I didn't go to the gym today. So really making things a habit Um Definitely trying to eat well. Um, you know, the, the great thing about the Sozo device is it's not just measuring fluid, it also measures body composition. So it can actually measure your uh, muscle mass and your, your hydration status and your, you know, your muscle levels. So I have actually started looking at that too and just thinking, okay, well, how am I going on muscle? Um, and sleep, you know, sleep is the most important thing. We just have to, you know, make sure that you sleep well and, and fully rested so that you're on your best. People underestimate the value of sleep. You know, they know that they need to work out. They know that they need to eat, right? But then they're on their phones late into the evening and not getting the rest that they need to, to have the energy to do the rest of the things that they need to do. So I love that you said that. And I hope that you women who are listening in get some good rest tonight, please, yeah. for you and for everyone around you. It's, it's, it, you can't pour into others when you're pouring from an empty cup. I'm, so I'm wondering, um, Dr. Parmjot, you know, what are some things that you do to overcome challenges in your life? You know, obviously we are hit, you know, nonstop with things happening in society or things happening to us, people passing away. There's lots of, I know you've seen a lot of 
experienced a lot of grief in your life just through the type of work that you're doing. Um, And so what are things that you do to just stay resilient, stay on top of things and, and keep going on? Yeah, no, no, exactly. You know what? I think we always have our ups and downs. <laughs> and as you said, you know, life, life comes, comes full of challenges. Um, I, you know what, I've got this underlying philosophy of you never step in the same river twice. <laughs> So, you know, life is always, so one thing is a mindset, life is always going to change, right? It will never be the same. Um, You will always, you will just always need to continue to adjust. Um, And, you know, that water is going to keep changing and keep flowing and just just learning how to flow with it um, and and just stay healthy and strong and resilient and and open for discussion and and dialogue and communication. I love that. I love that. That concept of the river and being one with the flow of it, right? (laughs) That makes sense. If you could give your younger self a piece of advice, whether it be personal or professional, what would it be? I know that's one of them, but I'm sure you have other things you'd love to tell your younger self or somebody else, a young woman looking to get into the type of career that you are in now. Yeah, I am. You know, I, one of the things I've well, I hadn't realized when I did. I started doing medicine and I worked as a doctor and you always think you're going to do the same thing you're going to do. But I have had so many career changes, um, things that I would never have thought I would have done. Um, and so just keep open to what's coming. You don't always know what the next step is going to be. Um, I've always kind of looked at my career as building sets of capabilities. And so really laddering up those and so building it up and then eventually it will all come together Um but no, just be open to change and be open to new experiences. Um, yeah. That is a great piece of advice and I'm going to take it for myself. So thank you. <laughs> so to finish off this conversation, right, you know, we talked a lot um, about uh, lymphedema awareness month and things that people should be aware of and education about it um, and about your personal life. But where can our listeners find you online to keep learning from you and growing from you and your insights? Oh, absolutely. So um, firstly, just impediment.com. So I-M-P-E-D-I-M-E-D.com. So that's our website. Um, lots of just wonderful information there. Um, LinkedIn is is the other key area that, you know, I think as a professional, I'm a LinkedIn person. Um, so yeah, just look at those areas. And we, you know, we do a lot of social around, um, particularly around lymphedema awareness. And um, yeah, and these wonderful conversations with like with you, Grace. <laughs> So I'm so happy you got to come on today. You know, before I forget, thank you for sharing that with us. But before I forget, did you happen to bring tea with you and tell me about either your tea or your mug? Oh, exactly. You know, my mug, my mug is just a local mug from from a shop here in Sydney, which which I really love. In fact, it's it's one of my go to presents that I give to people. (laughs) Because I love, I love it. It's such a nice mug. It's like has blue kind of different shapes and it looks kind of like it was handcrafted. It's very cute. But the tea, the tea is the one the interesting one. Um, you know, the last two years I was working up in the Gulf. So I was the country manager for Pfizer for the Gulf cluster of countries based in Dubai and looking after five markets. But I did a lot of travel. And so I went with a very close friend to Azerbaijan, um, Baku, mm. which I hadn't realized is, is the birthplace of oil. And so everywhere you go, there's like oil, yeah, I know, oil and gas, literally there's gas burning um, on the mountains because it's like they've had oil and gas there, but they have amazing tea because it's all very close to Turkey. And so we did spend a lot of time drinking tea. So my Azerbaijani tea um, is, is the one these days. That I'm running low because it's, you know, it was um, about three or four months ago I went. Um, so, yeah, that's my, my tea of the day and I have to track some more down. Well, that sounds delicious. Thank you for sharing that with us. And thanks for coming on the show today. Yes, thanks for having me, Grace. It was a lovely conversation. And thanks to you folks for joining us too. Check out the High Tea with Grace podcast website for more great guests like Dr. Parm Chat today. Cheers. Like a Girl Media is more than a media network. It's a community. We want to meet you and amplify your voice and the voices of outstanding women innovating in healthcare. Interested in starting your own podcast or hosting an event near you? Connect with us online or in person. We're here to support and empower you.